test this thing first. Testing, yep, it's working. All right, testing, testing. Hello, everybody, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our talk on digital sustainability. I'm Caitlin Lose, VP of Brand Marketing for Phase 2, so that means that I get to help set the direction for the brand and talk about awesome stuff like our perspective on digital sustainability, and I'm here with my colleague, Matt Curtin. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Curtin. I'm the, the uh, design director at Phase 2. Uh, I, this is actually my second time speaking in Portland. I was at the DrupalCon a couple years ago talking about designing Drupal experiences with Figma, so great to be back. Awesome. Uh, so I looked the other day, and I think that this is Phase 2's 26th DrupalCon, something like that. So we've been in the community a really long time. But for those of you who don't know us, Phase 2 is your digital experience partner for healthcare. We're all about digital experience that advances the human experience. So we make digital products that impact people's health and well-being. So that vision, digital experience that advances the human experience, is one of the big reasons that we are here to talk to you about this topic today. So let's get started with what is digital sustainability. The internet is really the closest thing that we ever get to touch to infinity. And as an elder millennial, the sense of endlessness has really defined the technology of my generation. And while we do pay for things like service charges and hosting fees and electricity bills and Wi-Fi passes, the vastness of the internet has always still felt roughly free. So when I first learned about digital sustainability, I think this is why I was so astonished. It had never really clicked for me that the vastness that I was experiencing was not free at all and really an insatiable bill being paid by our planet. I'd never deeply considered the choices we make in design, tooling, and functionality that have a huge impact on the energy consumed by the products that we make. So to answer the question, digital sustainability is the practice of designing and implementing digital design systems and technologies in a way that supports long-term ecological balance and reduces environmental impact. And the biggest thing that we've learned about digital sustainability is that it all adds up. When you get into this world, you're going to find yourself doing a lot of math. What is your page weight budget? How many offset credits do you need to buy? How much energy is each part of your site using? How are your organizational efforts impact, impacting your emission stats over time? How much money are you saving by using less energy and having a more performance site? This process is iterative, and it's all about trade-offs, incremental change. But it makes a huge difference in the total environmental impact of the internet. It also literally all adds up. So these are some stats from Drupal.org from Website Carbon. This is one of the measurement tools that we use to give you, give you an idea of how Website Carbon output is uh, measured. And I personally think we need to measure more things in units of bubbles. <laughs> Um, over the past three years, Phase 2 has built, experimented, and debated about digital sustainability, and now more than ever, we are absolutely committed to leading the way to a more sustainable digital world for the sake of healthy business, healthy people, and healthy planet. Because of this, Phase 2 announced on Earth Day this year that we are the first digital agency to sign the Health and Human Services Health Sector Climate Pledge. This is a serious climate commitment that means, among other things, we've committed to achieving net zero by 2050, reducing our emissions by 50% by 2030, and we've also committed to a stringent tracking and reporting of our Scope 3 carbon emissions, and I'll tell you more about what that means in just a bit. We did this in part because our amazing clients are leading the way in sustainability. Um, Advent Health, for example, signed the HHS pledge in 2022 um, and has an incredibly robust sustainability program, including on-site uh, renewable energy generation. They built a 60,000 square foot solar roof in Orlando that offsets more than 2,000 metric tons of carbon every year. And phase two's approach to sustainability extends beyond our own business commitments to bringing sustainability expertise consulting to our clients. So we consult on things like sustainable web design, hosting and tool selection, cost management and systems efficiency, digital emissions tracking, and sustainability marketing and communication. All right, thanks for the great introduction, Caitlin. So now it's time to talk about what's at stake from an environmental and business perspective. Let's start with environmental. We're all pretty well versed on the topic of climate change. Global temperatures are steadily rising, and we're really starting to see the impact of that on our environment. Rise in sea levels and more frequent extreme weather events, just to name a few examples. Uh, there are many factors in our digital lifestyles that are contributing to these environmental impacts. We'll be talking about carbon emissions the mo in the most detail today, since the impact on, of greenhouse gases is well documented. And we've, we, all, we also have quantifiable data showing us where we can take action and make impact. 
Um, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the other factors that we will not be discussing in as much depth. Storing data in the cloud sounds clean and sustainable, but in reality, this is powered by a growing number of data centers that need large amounts of water for cooling. E-waste and chemical pollution are both caused by electronic devices not being recycled properly. Not to mention the material extraction and mining of raw materials used to create these devices in the first place. Finally, there's a much larger topic uh, of climate justice. Developing countries are impacted the most by our digital lifestyles, but experiencing the least amount of the benefits. So as promised, let's dig into the carbon emission data a little bit. The energy consumption of the internet accounts for 3.7% of all greenhouse gas emissions. This percentage is comparable to the entire air travel industry or a small country. That's a total of 1.6 billion tons of emissions. 80 billion trees would need to be planted and growing for a full year in order to offset that number. Currently, 80% of the online data consumed in the form of movie, is consumed in, on the internet in the form of moving images. To be fair, that number does include a little bit of streaming. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention AI as well. The data shown here doesn't even take that into account. AI requires a ton of server, com server computing power, as I mentioned before, and we need to, a lot of water to cool those servers down. This is a really powerful quote from Tom Greenwood that resonates with our topic today. He is the author of a fantastic book, Sustainable Web Design, and a contributor to the original web manifest, uh, Sustainable Web Manifesto. The internet may be digital, but it carries a very physical cost. Small, thoughtful changes in design and development can reduce the damage while also making the web more resilient in the face of a changing climate. The original Sustainable Web Manifesto is mentioned a few times in this presentation because it really marks the beginning of our sustainable journey. In 2019, several organizations came together to establish this list of six principles and commitments. So much great work and progress has been made since these were created, but we have to acknowledge these first. Our products and services will be clean, powered by renewable energy, efficient, use the least amount of energy or raw materials, be open, accessible, and allow, allow users to control their own data. Be honest, they won't mislead or exploit users. Be regener regenerative, support the nourishment of people and the planet. And also be resilient, always function when and where people need them the most. And from the business perspective as well, digital sustainability is hugely consequential. Like so many other things in our industry, accessibility, data privacy, there's a spectrum between what we have to do with regulatory compliance and what we have the opportunity to do to differentiate and transform our businesses. And sustainability is the same. Regulation is here, more regulation is coming, there's no doubt about it. But truly innovative organizations use sustainability to transform their businesses. While 79% of Americans say they want to buy from brands that are environmentally friendly, most don't know how to identify these companies. This is such an interesting quote. Consumer preference across all industries shows a huge preference and a reasonable price tolerance for sustainable s services and products. But most brands have not figured out how to differentiate themselves as a sustainable practices. So this is an incredible opportunity. As these regulatory requirements are just emerging, right now we're really talking exclusively about tracking and reporting. And the reason for that is it provides accountability, transparency, and a baseline for making future improvements. And this sounds relatively simple, but it's anything but. Um, this graphic shows the way that the greenhouse gas reporting standards breaks down the way emissions are reported. Scopes one and two that you see in this graphic are the sort of things you'd think about. Buildings, cars, how much electricity you use. But scope three is all upstream and downstream activities that have a carbon impact in your business. So things like transportation of your products, waste generated by your operations, the sustainability commitment of all the vendors and partners that you work with as well. And scope three also encompasses digital sustainability. So your hosting emissions, the output of your site. And if you're in the business of making the internet, like many of us are, the output of all the sites that you've created as part of your business. This is very much, and it all adds up, part of the journey. And it's a serious effort to track uh, and report on all of this. 
So to get a sense of the reg regulatory requirements. It's helpful to look globally first because um, while the topic of digital sustainability is relatively new for us in the US, it's not in Europe. This is a major part of the CSRD in Europe. This law requires public companies to track and report on scopes one, two, and three emissions annually. California followed suit last year matching Europe's reporting standards for large public companies. And the SEC just recently instated scope one and two requirements uh, for all large US public companies and is likely to add scope three in the near term. In addition to the tracking and reporting requirements, the SEC has significantly increased the pressure around transparency and honesty when it comes to greenwashing. Back to that honesty piece. All of this is to say that regulations are here. Regulations are getting more broad and more stringent. Um, and as more and more organizations are looking to comply, partners and vendors will be increasingly asked for and judged by their ability to answer these tracking questions and the robustness of their sustainability commitments. So it's a lot to take on, but all of this detail and reporting allows consumers and businesses to be totally clear on the environmental impact of the businesses that they choose to engage with. And it's an amazing baseline of information to start making real meaningful progress towards tracking carbon emissions. And with so much focus on reporting and tracking, this has really given rise to a ton of consulting and software services for tracking carbon emissions. These are just a few. They all have a different focus and specialty. Uh, but this software helps to track down information, even connecting directly with utilities and third-party providers, and allows you to really track your progress over time. And since one of the way main ways that organizations can achieve their carbon goals is to purchase carbon offset credits, many of these companies have consulting to help you choose ethical, high quality credits that are aligned to your organization's brand story and goals. And just to note, this software is not specific to digital sustainability. It's about the organizational sustainability, but it is a part, digital sustainability is a factor. And one of the major business considerations is how innovation and creativity will be impacted by the environment. From chip shortages to water battles between data centers and farms, to the incredible cost of building out the grid uh, to, to support the power needed to run our energy hung hungry technology, organizations are gonna have a hard time sticking with the sustainability commitments that they've made and making use of AI and all the other advanced technology. Energy limitations could increasingly limit what we can do and how much it costs. So focusing on creating a clean, energy efficient, performant internet protects our very ability to innovate. Especially because 65% of global GDP is now under a net zero commitment in 2050. This is an equally inspiring and intimidating stat. It's the kind of number that means we need to fundamentally change the way we think about consumption and digital consumption is a big piece of that. Okay, so now that we have all of that context, we're gonna get really nerdy and start talking about all the details. Matt is gonna give us a crash course on sustainable web design. All right, so digging into this topic can be quite challenging. There's a ton of valuable resources out there, but there wasn't really a main source of truth or place to start. That is all beginning to change with the introduction of the web sustainability guidelines. So let's start with a brief introduction of these fairly new guidelines. This all began from a web, worldwide web consortium or W3C community group in 2013. It included mainly, member, uh, mainly members that were behind a lot of the original sustainable design resources that we've seen, like the Sustainable Web Manifesto that we talked about earlier. Over time, it evolved into a working group. Uh, it is important to note also that this group consists of executives and business decision makers as well. Uh, there is a focus on business outcomes as well as sustainability. This group was inspired by the uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, which have been the accessibility standard globally. The first version of the guidelines debuted last fall, and we've already seen five more releases. The goal of the WSGs are, one, to make it easier for anyone to apply sustainable principles to digital products and services. Two, measurably improve the Internet's in environmental, social, and economic pro uh, Im impact. And three, align efforts with existing reporting standards as seen with the Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI. Currently, there are 94 guidelines, 252 success criteria for testing, and they cover five main categories, UX design, web development, hosting, business and product strategy, and metrics. I don't know about you all, but that number of guidelines and testing criteria is still pretty overwhelming. Fortunately, these are nicely tagged, categorized, and searchable on sustainablewebdesign.org. Everything is open source and also in GitHub. 
Many of these formal guidelines, especially the UX design and development categories, are exciting to us because we can start applying them and factoring them into our work right away. Our primary goal is to lower the page weight and optimize the experience, keeping carbon emissions low with the products we build. Since we are a DrupalCon, I really want to get to the tips for our Drupal developers out there. However, I'd be remiss not to mention our user experience and content teams. This really all starts with them. From a UX perspective, we want to have clear, a clear understanding of our users and what they're trying to achieve. We want to solve their problems as quickly and efficiently as possible with intuitive navigation and well-placed calls to action. For our content strategists, we want to strive for clear, purposeful, and searchable content. Less friction and clutter leads to efficiency and sustainability. Let's take a deeper dive into a typical UX deliverable. Here's an example of, the, of a type of journey mapping that can be created for a particular audience persona. While we plan for what this sustainable platform will look like, we're thinking about common actions an audience member could take and how they are feeling along the way. What pain points are they experiencing? Are they hitting make or break moments of friction in achieving these objectives? How can the platform make these tasks and actions as quick, easy, and painless as possible? Through this research and these types of artifacts, we ensure that the design product is solving the right problems. We can also note sustainable design opportunities and highlight these for the client as we present the overall journey. I like to say the designers are the first line of defense for sustainable page weights. I go in more detail in a blog post on the Phase 2 website. I encourage you all to check it out. One of the first areas of page weight optimization is fonts and typography. If we aren't careful, fonts can be a sneaky contributor to the overall weight of a page. When serving font files, every weight and file type counts. We typically need to use custom web fonts, as seen with Google or Adobe, uh, Adobe fonts, and we like to limit these to two max. There's also a growing number of variable fonts being released. That means all weights and styles are loaded in one optimized file. Color decisions are becoming a larger factor, and we'll provide some more details in a moment on that. Uh, imagery and video are by far the biggest consumer of page weight budget. I'll say that many times during this presentation. So it's important to find ways to reduce in this area. When we talk about the re reusable components, design systems are always at top of mind. Sustainability doesn't mean removing all animations and movement from your site. It can be argued that motion can help navigate a visitor and improve their experience. However, there are more performant ways of introducing movement and CS uh, through CSS transitions, lightweight JavaScript libraries like GSAP, uh, and avoiding auto-playing video backgrounds. Optimizing color to conserve energy has been a really interesting topic for our team. Many laptop devices, including many that we're using right now, use LED screens which have one primary backlight source. So the color rendered on them is the same no matter what, the same energy output no matter what. However, more and more devices are using OLED technology, mostly in phones, but expanding to more and more devices over time. Uh, with OLED screens, we can impact energy consumption on a pixel by pixel basis. The data shown here in this chart is in microwatts to measure the amount of energy consumed based on the color of the individual pixels. That brings us to math time. Caitlin has actually <laughs> created uh, a formula for calculating pixel, pixel energy. Uh, the RGB values along with the screen brightness gives us this overall value based on the color decisions that we make. We've included some example values at the bottom here showing the color impact on the pixel energy values in watts. Um, while the highest energy, white is the highest energy value, uh, we can see that darker colors release a considerably lower amount of wattage. While black, uh, with the color black, the pixel doesn't turn on at all. Uh, we're seeing more and more companies integrating dark mode into their brands and interfaces. Uh, not only is this valuable from a pixel energy perspective as we just discussed, but it also can be easier on the eye reducing vision fatigue as we spend more and more time looking at monitors. The screenshot here is from the Goldman Sachs design system. Uh, the, their design team made an investment in dark mode, as seen here with the, with the data visualization uh, samples. Uh, we're seeing browsers and operating systems giving users the option for dark mode. Maybe our products should as well. A recent Purdue study involving smartphones, which use the OLED screen technology, found that when using auto brightness, the energy savings for dark mode is between three and 9%. If the screen brightness is set to 100%, the savings can be as high as 47%. Many of these topics we just covered, color, typography, and other treatment decisions, can all be do documented and standardized with a design system. 
by establishing a design system early on, we're ensuring that our web components are built with consistency and can be reusable from page to page. This results in a cleaner and more efficient code base that can be easily cached. Okay, now that I've gotten all the design save page weight savings out of the way, it's time to talk about sustainable web development for Drupal. Many of these tips and features are supported right out of the box in Drupal and involve easy, or involve easy to install and configurable open source resources. We've already been thinking about reusable components during the design, and that translates directly to code and the web components that we build in our main source of truth. We will take uh, um, a, a deeper dive into the image optimizations. That is by far, again, the largest contributor to page weight. We will discuss what lazy loading is and what that means for performance. Um, Drupal helps with file aggregation and file compression, minimizing the amount of the total files like JavaScript and CSS needed to render the page, along with the removal of extra lines in those files, making them sm much, much smaller. Uh, caching static parts of the site in the browser is important so that we only need to load it once from the server. Drupal provides built-in support for integrating with content delivery networks, or CDNs, with, uh, through the CDN module, allowing you to offload static assets and files to third-party servers that are closer to your users. Cloudflare is one, of, is one common CDN provider that we recommend. As I've said many times, and I'll say again, large images are the bane of bandwidth usage. The biggest issue that we see perform with performance is loading an unnecessarily large image compared to the size it actually needs to be when rendered on the web. Drupal has so many great capabilities out of the box when it comes to image styles and responsive image settings. This is one of the first elements we focus on during development since it's so important to get right. We want to perfect the use of these settings in Drupal, convert files to smaller formats like WebP, and use external services like TinyPNG. Anything that we can do to scale the file size down without sacrificing quality is the goal. Here's one example of the WebP module in action for one of our clients, the standard. The original image that was uploaded to the home page was two megs, and with the WebP module, we're able to scale it down 10 times in size without seeing any loss in quality. It was also just announced uh, yesterday in the Dries note that Drupal 11 will use the WebP module image by, uh, format by default. Videos help engage our audience and make our content much more memorable. But like images, they bring a huge page weight cost. How can we optimize these assets without sacrificing quality? Using an HTML vid HTML5 video player like Flow Player that's, that supports features like progressive loading and adaptive bitrate ensures a smooth watching experience even from a poor connection. As mentioned previously, a CDN can serve these static video assets from servers geographically closer to your users. Uh, during design and development, we also recommend static clickable video teasers rather than loading the standard third-party embed video uh, during page load. Lazy loading images uh, involves rendering parts of the page that are only visible at the top of the user's device viewport. Um, we, might have, um, we might have several media assets lower on the page, but why load them when there's no guarantee the user's gonna scroll far enough to see them? It's a complete waste of bandwidth. Drupal has lazy loading features baked in for images. Since the majority of the page has already loaded, these files load in very quickly and don't interrupt the page viewing experience. One of the core values of Drupal is its flexible and modular architecture. We have the, abil the ability to tap into countless modules and integrations to really build whatever we want. However, we need to keep in mind that the more we install, the more weight we add to the platform and risk redundant and wasteful code. The base Drupal install is lightweight, as we can see with some of these carbon emission stats. Let's see what we can do to keep it that way. One opinion we've heard is that sustainability and accessibility recommendations conflict with each other. That is becoming less and less the case, especially with the work we've seen uh, from the W3C group mentioned previously. Here's just a few examples. Adhering to W3C WCAG guidelines leads to a simpler and leaner code base and loads faster and consumes less energy. Using semantic HTML markup and following best practices, uh, best coding practices, um, leads to better ca capabilities, uh, compatibility as across all devices and browsers. No need to throw away that old device. Designing for keyboard operability eliminates the need for extra JavaScript to support screen readers. 
Awesome. So now that we are all sustainable web design uh, experts, we can talk about the marketing and communication side. So in addition to actually lowering your page weight, how you position and share your sustainability perspective on your site is a really important way to advocate for sustainability through storytelling, to lead by your actions, and to get some great visible wins towards your ESG goals and commitments. Oops. The first consideration of your sustainab uh, is your sustainability page itself. First, make sure that you have one, um, and you can increase the impact of that page by making it really visible and discoverable on your site, having robust commitments, and sharing a point of view and expertise that's deeply tied to your brand and to your values. Another consideration is including content around your sustainability expertise and point of view to really add to the conversation. This should be really intrinsically tied to what your organization does. This is Matt's awesome post that he mentioned earlier. And your brand identity in itself can do a great job showing and not just telling your sustainability commitments. So back to the sustainable web design principles Matt was talking about, your brand identity can use sustainable colors, font choices, image styles, and you don't have to rebrand to do this. We all know that brands are always evolving. So as you're making these decisions evolving your brand, consider the sustainability of the choices that you're making. And ideally, you're not the only one talking about sustainability. Having partnerships, press, and other social proof will give you credibility with your efforts. So this can be clients, media, and even noting um, the carbon calculating software that you might work with. There are some really cool things out there for organizations who are very sophisticated and mature in their sustainability efforts. A couple of examples. Um, you'll see more and more sites putting carbon calculators on the bottom of each page, so users can understand the carbon output of each page that they're on. Uh, the second one, we're all probably pretty familiar with, Google's Green Leaf. Um, this is a really great example of surfacing sustainable choices on your site. So depending on your business, this can mean different services, products, or experiences that you can guide the customer towards that's a more sustainable choice. The last image shows Branch Magazine that has a grid-dependent digital experience. That is, the experience of the site itself adjusts colors, fonts, et cetera, in real time to increase or decrease energy output based on the demand on the grid at the time. Just wildly cool, right? <laughs> so with all this information, what is your team going to do next? What are the first steps that you will take? We have some suggestions and even more resources to share. Uh, the first step is establishing a plan for testing your existing platforms. We need to see how we measure up and what we need to address first and prioritize. We have listed out the performance uh, measurement tools that we use uh, for initial testing and continued benchmarking. Uh, these tools are mostly open source and free to use. Uh, Lighthouse and PageSpeed Insights are both from Google. Uh, Web page test allows for certain numbers of scans for free per month uh, and also has added a sustainability feature recently called Carbon Control. Uh, we included two recommendations for carbon emission scanning, EcoGrader and Beacon. We initially found that these tools provided drastically different carbon emissions data, but it's steadily improving over time. A new version of EcoGrader will be released very soon, and we can't wait to try it out. Uh, a few things to note with this new release. Uh, there will be the ability to monitor ongoing page performance improvements, as well as testing multiple pages instead of just one at a time. Hosting data will be much more targeted, giving an exact green hosting score as opposed to just a pass-fail. Third-party tools and integrations will also be part of this audit. The social sharing widget on your website is about to get called out. We also recommend looking at the sustainable qualities uh, from your partners in the software that you use. Do they provide any transparency regarding their carbon footprint? What are they doing to help the situation? Here are just a few examples of our partners and tools that we're proud of. Acquia, Platform SH, Figma, and Yext. Acquia has committed to being 100% carbon neutral by 2050 and has two great offset partnerships with Tree Nation and Cool Effect for solar installation. Platform SH publishes annual carbon emissions data on Greenly. Uh, Figma formed a, a net zero social impact group in 2021 and has committed to being carbon neutral by 2040. Yext has part, have partnerships with Green, green Places for sustainable data integrations and hosts sustainable events. Whether it involves carbon neutral commitments, impact groups, CO2 art, uh, offset partnerships, or continued educational resources, they are all fantastic contributors. Another next step is continued research and education. Caitlin and I are part of a guild at phase two that is constantly sharing links and inspiration. 
One great collection of resources that we found is from the Sustainable UX Network. They pulled together a great collection of tools and information to get you started. They even have a podcast featuring some of the experts. Okay, so let's get a little bit more specific about setting and tracking goals. Depending on your goals, it may be important for you to do a more detailed benchmarking exercise than using a tool like EcoGrader will give you. This is an example of a benchmarking activity we did for one of our clients. It considers multiple benchmarking tools as well as performance scores, and then it multiplies everything by average page views to get really detailed report of carbon output. Once you have this level of detail, it provides the information that you need to make incremental improvements and plan your web design and development strategy math. Another important point is to really make sure that you are measuring what it is you want to improve. This will be different from organization to organization, but a couple of them you may want to consider. Organizational goals and ESG values. This is really the place to start. Sustainability efforts need to advance your commitments and your brand. Many organizations have signed a wide variety of sustainability agreements and commitments, which have specific benchmarks that you need to achieve. Um, as Matt noted, the web sustainability guidelines are an excellent guidepost, no matter what you're doing, to creating a sustainable site. And the greenhouse gas protocol that I mentioned earlier has really specific ways of measuring scopes one, two, and three. And finally, there's also an ISO standard that's specifically about integrating environmental considerations into product design and development. No matter what you decide you're trying to achieve, it's important that you set yourself up with a great baseline and track thoughtfully so that you can show progress and find areas to improve. There's no one right way to measure. This might be the part of the presentation where you go, whoa, 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 this is way too much. My organization hasn't even started. I'm just learning about this today. And seriously, that's totally OK. No matter where you are in your journey, this is about taking one step at a time. And that first step, step besides coming to listen to us yammer about this for an hour, is to find your kindred spirits. Um, enrollment starts small. Matt managed to dig up this awesome Slack message from almost exactly two years ago when I started the conversation with him and another colleague. And it's been a journey of enrolling sort of one person at a time, bringing it in really small and bigger ways to our clients and incorporating it into our brand and story, and now signing this major pledge and talking with you all today. So it's all about starting with where you are and looking for your footholds. Um, does this align perfectly with your organization's vision and values? Do you have an angle of expertise that you can bring to the conversation or something that you know that your customers need? Do you want to be an individual contributor? Do you want to join the WC3 working group and get in on the planning? There are so many ways in, and it's not even a little bit too late to be really a part of this thing that's developing. And beyond just finding your people, there are so many other ways to join in. First, start by measuring. Um, we've shown you a few tools, and there are others out there, but just get started. Get a feel for it. Start to measure yourself and other sites that you, that you use. Um, track your own digital emissions habits. Just uh, go through a day and think about the activities that you do, and you'll see it in a whole different light. Things like picking up your phone when you're bored or cranking up your brightness or using ChatGPT for dumb stuff. Um, read, listen, and absorb. Matt showed you some great resources. There are so many more out there, and we can point you to, to, to more. Um, these conversations are really, really interesting right now and evolving really, really fast. Follow leaders on the topic and be a part of the conversation. Join in. And more than anything, keep learning. So Matt and I have learned a lot in the last couple of years, but we're still just scratching the surface. This field is changing all the time, and it's a really fun ride. So to add some closing thoughts here, it all comes back to the math. Um, the emissions that your sites create and how you make changes to improve them. The efforts and commitments that your organization has made. The value you create with a more performance site. It's all about incremental changes and small steps towards something bigger. And to step back more broadly, we're in such an interesting moment of conflicting uh, forces heading into the unknown. On the internet, our attention is currency. We can have as much green power as we want, but if our goal is to keep eyes on screens as long as possible, there's a sustainability conflict. AI, 5G, and other energy-consuming technology advances have an insatiable energy appetite. And yet, the promise of advanced AI modeling means that we might be able to use this technology to reduce energy use. Many organizations have made these big promises on cutting emissions with no real idea of how to do it other than buying carbon offset credits and having speculative optimism for the future. But despite all of these tensions, many organizations are getting it right. And without a doubt, this is an amazing time to be a part of the conversation.
So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Matt and I are here for your questions and we're also gonna be speaking at the Health Summit on Thursday and we'd love to see you there. Any questions? Yeah, it, it would still be a benefit because you're, yeah, you're still not loading that asset at all until they scroll to the viewport, that section of the viewport. The video stuff is tricky. Um, I think what comes, what it comes down to is, I think it's okay to use a third party to stream it. Um, one thing I, I mentioned is, is potentially not loading that initially and just right. like making sure that's as long as we're not like auto playing things like that. If, if there's, if we can find ways to like steer our clients away from, like doing those auto auto playing type of interactions, it's it's from an accessibility standpoint, you know, it's not great. And then from a sustainable standpoint, we can, we have that, we now have a little bit of that argument as well in terms of the bandwidth. My last question is, I've noticed lately, it might've been happening longer than lately, but I've noticed lately that when you're like on uh, like a news site or something, like even if you're watching a video, if you switch to another tab, that video just stops playing and you can hear it in the background. Is that, um, do you know if that's one of the methods that they're using for sustainability? So like if our customers are on our site and they're watching a video, they may want to try and play that in the background while they're checking their email or something. Responsibly, from a sustainability point of view, should we be tracking that video or making the company track it? Great question. Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> and, <laughs> I don't and, know the answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Not I'm not gonna so, lie, there are some times where I find that, I'm like, I wanna listen to this something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah right. Um, <laughs> right, right, but, um, I would say yes, obviously, because you know if someone's moving away from it, we'd probably want to campaign for that. Maybe we do it through a setting of something. Like I can, um, you know, one thing we've seen is exactly like you know allowing somebody to turn that off or on. Another you know setting we could think about is like the the quality of those videos. Like, do you really need the most HD video in the world, quality in the world, to, when you're just trying to listen to something and get some information? May we allow those settings to be, maybe we default to those lower resolution settings so it's more sustainable that way. So just things to think about. And there's probably a more thorough answer in the web sustainability yeah, yeah. guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're learning still. So. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. No, it's great. Great questions. Absolutely, and in fact, that's one of the things on our own site. We made great sustainability um, advances, and then the you know eco grader and all the graders changed to include that, and now we're kind of catching back up. So yes, absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. That is a great question. Yeah, uh, do not have an answer on that one, but we'll. Yeah. we'll We'll figure it out. <laughs> um, I, I would say, you know, obviously the more CSS you're loading initially, the, the larger the files, right? So um, if there's a way we can trigger the loading of that styling in an efficient way when, when we know the user's looking for it, um, or call like light or dark mode, and don't, lo don't just load them both in preparation for a user making that decision, that's probably the recommendation I would make. That is a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think using an HTML5 player in general is just, it's well documented that's more f performant than using YouTube or Vimeo just as a embed that you just f throw on your page. Um, you know, I think we're still exploring some of those things. Another tool that we're using also is Fresh Paint um, in terms of loading in those, that video content as well. Um, that's another option as well in, in terms of like a sustainable option and also just a more compliant option in terms of tracking and things like that. Um, video is like, 
pretty in-depth topic, <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, you stumped me there. But uh, but yeah, I, I think this the whole goal of my slide there is really just u using other ways of embedding video than just throwing an embed and loading it when a page a page loads. Use HTML5 instead. Right. Yeah, if you're yeah. serving a past version from all these different components, mm -hmm. how do you actually measure the impact that's having on the system itself? Right. I think I think what we're seeing with some of the changes in EgoGrader, which um, you know, they, they announced they're launching a new version of that. It's been a few weeks now, so I'm not sure when that's gonna go live, but there's a lot more targeting in that regard um, for third party scans and testing. So I, I do think a lot of that data is going to be visible with that in terms of how sustainable are these third-party things that you're offloading that hosting to? And I would think if you're, if you have stuff that's behind the scenes getting read at one in these web services, mm -hmm. you're not really able to assess the impact of those as well. Is that something that you have a, some kind of measurement place for? Mm -hmm. We have entered my level of expertise. Yes, I, no, I, I, I <laughs> We have surpassed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, right when you said rest, I was like, oh man. <laughs> Thank no, thank no. you. That's great. That's I appreciate great, the means. answer. Yes, for yeah. sure. <laughs> I, I should have given you the mic on that one. Um, no, there was a reason why I didn't have several slides of CDN stuff, because I, I actually, um, we started having conversations with our developers, and they're like, what about this? What about this? I'm like, oh, uh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, a response to the CSS, um, you can state to enable CSS files that are being loaded that give React. I can use state as a dark mode, true or false. There you go. Sort of the other idea. Mm -hmm. Clever. Anybody doing anything really cool in your organization around sustainability? Any stories? Awesome. <laughs> That's the right place to be. <laughs> you nag enough. Yeah. <laughs> the right people nag. If oh, I yeah. Know, For sure. Find your people. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Find your advocates. <laughs> Yes. Your employees should have low flow showers. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, that's actually something that we've been addressing. So we use Carbon Hound as our, our um, software that we've used, and they do really amazing modeling. So you can put in a certain amount of information about where your people are and you know some rough stats, and they have third-party validated modeled information that's much, much more accurate. So you can send an, you know, a survey out to your employees with two questions and get a pretty pretty decent estimation. Um, and the tools are, you know, they're, they're all, of course you pay for all of them. They're not outrageously expensive and we've found it to be really, really helpful. We're just sort of getting into that journey actually. So companies are gonna start making us move to small towns giving us water. Yeah, exactly. They're gonna start monitoring your water use now. <laughs> doing, a, doing a house audit for where you're working, yeah. There's no way the shower outweighs your car. 